Okay. Thank you, Blake. Thank you all for being here. Uh, several weeks ago, um, I don't know who I was talking to. Maybe it was Peter, maybe it was Alan or somebody, and uh, maybe it was my wife. I don't know. I thought we were talking about names, and, and I, po I threw out the idea of talking about names, and then Blake and I have talked about pronouns for the last, I don't know how many years. Uh, and um, we thought, well, this would be a good service. And then Alan said, well, you know, we have to find a service for Pride Week. How about this? And so here we are. Um, so here goes. So once a child comes into this world, the challenge that many parents face is just what to name that new creature. Sometimes that's easy. Uh, family pr tradition provides guidance. My college friend, David Moshi Judah, was the son of Moshi David Judah who is the son of David Moshi Judah, who is the son of Dave, uh, David Moshi Judah, and on and on and on, went through generations. Uh, the, the, that line is stopped because my friend has no children, so that, that's the end of that particular lineage. Some parents are enamored by a partic the, the name of a friend or a relative or a noted person. Our granddaughter's middle name is Marie. And that's also the middle name of our niece's granddaughter, both born around the same time, and that's in order of our, my wife Joan's mom, Marie. During the 1930s, many German boys were named Adolf after the leader of their country. Following the Allied victory in 1945 and the defeat of Nazism, I'm sure many of those Adolfs figured out a way to change their name. Parents also strive to avoid certain names. When we uh, told a friend that we were considering her a name should we have a boy she said oh she could never name a child that because she worked with a guy by that name and she just couldn't stand them and every time she would say that name it would just conjure up all these bad feelings well we knew months in advance what we would name our firstborn but when number two came along well that was another story one of the possibilities was Natasha that was quickly nixed, uh, envisioning many jokes emanating from those characters in the Rocky and Bullwinkle co uh, comic series, Boris and Natasha. Who just did, I just didn't want to do that. I, I'm not sure, I think Joan was looking at other alternatives. There are but a few uh, these are but a few of the considerations that come into play when naming a child. And there's the legal name and the name that is used. Our grandson is William, but from the get-go he has been Will. Our daughter is Catherine with a K, but we called her Kate for short. And I'm sure you could think of other examples. Well, at some point, the child becomes more aware of their name and, the, and uh, either takes char uh, ownership of it or modifies it. So when Kate was in a little kid and she was in pre uh, preschooler, the husband of her child care provider would call her Kathy. Well, that just bugged her to no end. And she said, no, I am Kate. Um, the firstborn of uh, friends of ours in California is named Harold, but they start calling him Hal. Then about age four, he said, my name is Harold. You will call me Harold. I am Harold. I have worked with people who I thought their names were Al, Dean, or Greg. But in fact, that was their middle name. Their real names are James, Donald, and Clayton. Uh, they never use those names. Never, ever, ever. Add to this the people who have a heritage that goes beyond the northern and western European majority that surrounds us. At our ch here, at All Souls, we had a child care provider uh, some, not too many years ago from Lincoln High, uh, and his mom and dad were members, Mato. Mato uh, was Lakota uh, Sioux heritage. Uh, in Mateau uh, in Lakota is bear. Our son Rahul Bansal and his wife Como had their first child this past October and his name is Soham. Soham in Sanskrit means, this may fit into Blake, it means he, she, or that. Uh, it's also a name, as uh, Como will say, is that people can pronounce. Um, in some countries, there is a list of names that are allowed and names that are not allowed. Iceland is one such example. Uh, they have a, um, a bureau 
the National Registry of Persons. And if the name's not on that list, and if you're an Icelander, sorry, you can't have it. Now you can appeal. You can pay a fee and you can say, hey, you know, I want to have Harriet as a name for my child. Harriet is one of the no no-go names in, in Iceland. I don't know why. Um, and they review it and they either go thumbs up or thumbs down. You know, just uh, a few years ago, the Icelandic Parliament passed the Gender Autonomy Act, uh, guaranteeing transgendered and intersex individuals the right to self-identification. Because in Icelander, Icelandic, you have for guys S-O-N, that's the name, and for uh, women, it's daughter, uh, uh, D-O-T-T-I-R, but the, now there are alternatives with respect to this uh, non-binding gender e equality. So as you can see, naming someone or even naming yourself can be a daunting task. Now those, there are those of us with easy names to pronounce. I'm Greg Boris, that's pretty easy. My dad's name was Andy Boris. That's pretty easy too. His father's name was Boris Stefan Shaw. Not too easy. S-T-E-P-F-A-N-Z-O-F-F -F -F in the non-Cyrillic rendition of it. So when my grandpa came to, to, this, to this country in the early 20th century and went to work in the coal mines of western Pennsylvania, his boss said, Boris, what? No, you're going to be Steve Boris. And um, from then on in, he was Steve Boris. That's how he was known. That's all my uncles and aunts. They were Borises. And that was that. Now, he had cousins and siblings who came over. And, they, and the officials, the powers that be, said, we can't pronounce Stefan's show either. Some of them became Stepanics. Some of them became Stevenses. Some came some became something else. I can't do genealogy as a result of that because I have no idea and my grandfather died in the 40s. The question that comes to my mind is who determines what our name is? For com so I'm coming to the United States, it's that person's decision uh, what they're going to do. So the uh, this family I grew up with in Chicago were the Trigonas family. Well, no, they weren't the Trigonas family. They were from Greece and they became the Troys because Troys were not as loaded as the Greek word Trigonas. When I taught down in Vermilion, I had a lot of Taiwanese students, and they all, many, almost every one assumed a, a, an anglicized name, like Tom, or Dylan, or Joanne, or Betty. In Iceland, it's a governmental agency. For my grandfather, it was his workplace, where his only the only place where his name survives is on his tombstone. For some with multisyllabic last names, they may choose to go by another name. Much like my friends who go by their middle names, these people figure out an alternative of their choosing. One of my colleagues at the university does just that and goes by Dr. D. One of my daughter's teachers at middle school was Mrs. T. A former colleague of mine recognize that pronouncing and even spelling Yuruhomovich proved challenging. So she changed her professional name to Jeremy, which people can spell and which they could pronounce. These are mostly choices that people made on their own behalf. In recent years, other issues have come to the fore. When my wife Joan taught a community ed course at the uh, former ele uh, Low Longfellow Elementary School, uh, kids had these open lockers and they had their names above the open lockers. And is Longfellow had a wide range of students going there. And you'd look at these names and you go, first, how do you pronounce it? Second, is that a boy or a girl? I don't know, because they were from cultures that weren't mine. Um, Names not found in the community as a whole can be particularly difficult on children. Children may ask, why did my parents name me this weird name? This is so embarrassing. When Joan and I lived in St. Paul, we uh, were somewhat involved in the Irish community. One of the women in that group named her son Liam. 
Now Liam, I think, you know, with Liam Neeson and all, has gotten some traction lately, but then Liam Neeson was nobody. And at that time, he was maybe eight or nine, and he hated his name. He just hated it. And when we would say, well, when someone would say, well, what's your name? He would say, it's male spelled backwards. You know, he just wouldn't even say Liam. One issue for people with different than the majority culture name is when people you work with or, or you are subordinate to ask what they, if they can call you something else rather than asking you how to pronounce your name. How do you respond? Should I say, well, just call me Bob? Uh, no, I have a name. Another issue is that people will purposely or through lack of effort mispronounce your name. Calling someone Joanne instead of Joan is one that hits our household. Or dealing with that coastal call center employee who looks at your zip code and says, oh, Sayux Falls. Or that East Coast or West Coast elementary teacher when teaching state capitals and says, the name of that state capital in South Dakota is Pierre. No, it's not. It's Pierre. Um, our name is central to our identity. Accepting a person's name is critical for inclusion in the school, the workplace, and community. In a recent article in the Harvard Business Review, Ruchika Tulshayan noted that our names are a key component of belonging, of feeling like you're valued, and being seen and being heard. And if your name comes from a culture, that's not the, dom the dominant culture. Your name is part of that attachment, part of your attachment to that culture. At the school level, when mis teachers mispronounce the students' names all the time, the children can feel ashamed, like they don't belong. People and organizations miss out on opportunities because of their name, with study after study showing that when recruiters and hiring managers are looking at resumes, of equal weight, they're less likely to call back people whose names are not Anglo-Saxon. So what can a person do? One can say, I'm sorry, you're mispronouncing my name. Here's how you say it. Still the mispronunciation gets repeated. Well, one can just, you know, suck it up and accept it, or you can be persistent and say, no, it's pronounced this way. I have a student this year from Ethiopia whose first name is Rediet. And, you know, occasionally I mess it up and I say, am I saying it right? Or I think I'm messing it up and I say it right. And you need to do those checks, I think, at some time. As people become more comfortable in their own skin, they become more comfortable in making this correction. This is something that kids have a hard time doing. They're not going to go to their teacher and say, hey, teacher, you're, um, you're mispronouncing my name goes this way. Anyway, I'll conclude by repeating that our names are an important, an incredibly important part of our identity. They carry deep personal, cultural, familial, and historical connections. They give us a sense of who we are, the communities to which we belong, and our place in the world. With that, I'll turn it to Blake. Thank you. And, and just continuing that uh, discussion on identity, I, I think names are very important. And um, when we when we move on from names uh, to to discuss how we how we address each other and address ourselves and how we identify, um, I really liked what Joy was saying at the beginning of the importance of language, uh, especially in this community. And I think that goes really well into what I, I came to talk about today, which is uh, to discuss pronouns with you. So raise of hands, who knows what part of a speech what part of speech pronouns are and, and how to how how they're used yeah yeah so uh, we're all pretty familiar with pronouns um, you know I think we're taught in maybe about sixth grade about pronouns and then you might remember after a while but for some of us uh, sixth grade was a little while ago um, so it's important that we continue to reflect on these on these things and and how to use them so I'll, I'll give you the answer for for those of you who aren't quite sure what a pronoun is so a pronoun is a part of speech that replaces a noun. So um, if my name is Blake, so I have a pronoun, so if someone else were to talk about me and use something other than my name, they would use a pronoun. And so when that comes um, becomes important, is it's how we identify. So when 
Uh, if, if, if Greg and, and Joy were to talk about me, um, they could just say Blake every time, right? They could say, Blake did this, Blake did that. Um, that would be kind of cumbersome after a while, and so they could use pronouns instead to shorten that or make it less awkward. And so the pronouns that I identify with are masculine pronouns, he, him, and his. Um, and then the typical feminine pronouns, as most of you are aware, I'm sure, are she, her, and hers. And so a, a great uh, chunk of people like to use the, either one of those pronouns, right? He, him, his, she, her, hers. However, there are a wide variety of other pronouns that people choose to identify with. Um, during my uh, gender bread story earlier, I talked a little bit about masculine and feminine presentation and how we, uh, most people kind of fall somewhere in the, in the spectrum in between completely masculine or completely feminine. And so a lot of people are uh, realizing that they don't necessarily fit into those boxes of he, him, his, or she, her, hers and choose to, to identify with other types of pronouns to describe themselves. And there's a ton of pronouns that are, are coming out that, um, you know, that we call neo-pronouns or new pronouns that uh, Z, 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 M, and Z, 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 and they're hard to remember, but um, that's why it's important always to, um, kind of as Greg was talking about, uh, discuss with someone how they identify and respect and try your best to um, go with what they are comfortable with and what they prefer. Um, but the, the pronoun that um, is gender neutral um, that you may have heard of is they, them, right? So there, there's that, that pronoun that we um, are all already using in our daily lives without uh, maybe realizing it. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example of that. So um, it's a really hot time right now, right? So I mean, we're, most of us aren't wearing coats. But in the winter time, maybe, maybe we come here and um, someone leaves a coat in your row. And as, you're, as everyone's getting up to leave, uh, you might grab that coat and, and bring it out front and say, someone left their coat. Here, take your coat. Someone left their coat. Is this someone's coat? Um, and just by saying, someone left their coat, you're already using that, that singular they. Um, you, alternatively, and in the past, maybe we would use he, her, his or her. Someone could say, someone left his or her coat. But um, it comes up, becomes a little cumbersome. Um, and so we typically would use a, a singular they pronoun. Um, and, and really, this isn't a new concept. Uh, the singular they pronoun was used as early on as in Shakespeare's time. And as we know, Shakespeare invented quite a few words in the English language. And so the they pronoun has been um, really been used throughout a lot of history. Um, we also see this pronoun used a lot in the transgender community. Um, people who don't necessarily identify with the, the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, I know Greg talked a lot about, um, oh, is this a, a male name or a female name? Or we couldn't, couldn't tell if they were a boy or a girl just by looking at their, their name on their locker. Um, and so a lot of people do, do choose to use they pronouns and, um, in the trans community. Um, and why is it important for us to respect this? It might be just so much easier to uh, stick in our comfort zone and say, well, I'm comfortable with he or she, or this person looks like they would be a he or they would be a, a, a she. So that's what I'm going to use. Um, but the reason why this is so important, we can look at the youth in our country and uh, some really harrowing statistics. Um, I don't have, I have them written down on, on my PowerPoint so I can find you the exact statistics, but something like, 50% of trans youth um, attempt suicide at some point in their life. So that is one out of two trans people. Um, and that's, that's a really harrowing statistic. And this is common among the LGBT community in general. Um, rates of suicide, homelessness, um, all of these other medical issues uh, come up time after time in our youth and people are dying. And it's really important that we recognize that just being affirming and accepting of someone's pronouns can be life-saving for them. So um, there's also some really uh, good statistics that we can, we can see. So people who, um, so trans youth who, who had their pronouns respected, for instance, had a 75% less chance of attempting suicide. So just by accepting someone's pronouns and trying your best to Say they them if they if if those are the pronouns and respect that. 
um, can be life-saving. And then also being an affirming space. So a space such as this, having an adult to talk to that is affirming of, of gay or transgender individuals um, also significantly reduces the risk of mental health issues and suicide. So being this open space, I'm so glad to uh, you know, be welcomed here with, with my own identity of being a gay man and also um, being asked to speak about these issues that I think a lot of spaces and churches might not be uh, so welcoming of. So I appreciate that. And I will end with a little perspective taking exercise that we can all engage in together. So if you have a piece of paper to write on, you can write it on a piece of paper, you can use your phone, or you can use your, your mind if, if you so choose. But I would like you all to um, write down or think about five different things. So the first one is uh, a friend or a loved one who is not a member of your family. The second person I want you to write down is the name of a family member. Uh, the third thing is a hobby or passion of yours. The fourth thing is a material possession that you would not want to lose, something, something that you really care about. And then number five is a dream job. So it could be a firefighter or uh, whatever, whatever job you have, hopefully, uh, could be your dream job. But if not, uh, choose something that you would like as a dream job. All right. And for this exercise, once you have those five things uh, written down or, or thinking about those things, I want you to imagine that you were born, me born male, but discovered from a young age that you identified as female. All right. So watching Cinderella with a friend, you're about six years old, you're watching Cinderella with a friend, and you are talking with this friend and you say, wow, I really want to be just like Cinderella. Um, your friend asks what you mean, and you say, no, I really feel like Cinderella. That friend says to you that you're, you're being weird and that they can't hang out with you anymore. So mark that person off your list. So a few, a few years later down the line, you're starting high school, and um, you start wearing more feminine, feminine clothes in secret um, and at home. While you're, while you're home alone, you feel more comfortable, and you start wearing more feminine clothes. Um, you think it's the 21st century, my family loves me, um, I should be myself to them. So you tell a close family member that you are trans and that you identify as a female. They tell you it's just a phase and they refuse to talk to you anymore. You wonder that you worry that you might have to leave home. Mark that number two person off your list. A little further down the line, uh, you're in college now, you've found a community of people to hang out with who support and care for you just as you are. One day you see a sign for a student organization for that number three thing on your list. You decide to go check out a meeting. After the meeting, the president of the organization introduces himself and says that he respects your right to do what you want, but that members of the group wouldn't feel comfortable around you. He asks you not to come back. Cross number three off your list. After leaving the meeting, you come back to your room and find that threats have been written on your door and your room has been broken into. That number four thing has been destroyed. Mark that off your list. Finally, later in life, you, you think that things are finally turning around and things are looking good and you got your ideal job, that dream job that you've been working towards. You're at work one day and the company decides to do a guess the baby picture activity. So you submit your picture and you think nothing of it. The next morning, you get called into a meeting where your boss tells you the company is downsizing, and they'll have to let you go. Mark number five off your list. So this is not meant to be um, the experience of every LGBT person. Um, and this is a particularly tragic story, right? There's a lot of, of negative things that happened in this person's life. However, it is not an overly dramatic story. These things do happen, and it's important for us to realize that they do happen. Um, so I'm, I'm going to leave you with these thoughts to, to ponder on, um, and I look forward to discussing um, some of them with you after the service. <laughs>